Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar series for the freshwater stewardship community. We're very excited to have Leanna here from the Invasive Species Center and to kind of round off our Invasive Species Awareness Week programming this week. Leanna is the program development intern at the Invasive Species Center and she's our keynote speaker today. And then my name is Monica. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada. And there's also Nicole from our team who is the Freshwater Health Coordinator. And she is in chat to help any of you with your Q&A questions or if you're having any tech issues or if you have more questions about Watersheds Canada's programs, you are welcome to send her a private message through Zoom. And we will be with you for the next little while for this presentation. If you are unaware of Watersheds Canada, I would just like to share some of our programs with you. So we are a national charity that focuses on freshwater stewardship and engagement programs. And we do this through a number of different programs like fish habitat restoration, which you can see in the top left, our natural edge, natural restoration, restoration, program, which is where we restore shorelines with native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers, which you can see in the top right. We have our Love Your Lake program, which is a shoreline assessment and evaluation program delivered in collaboration with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And then we have that in our bottom left. And then a newer program of ours is our nature discovery programming, which focuses on getting children and youth out in local nature and leading local stewardship programs. And all of our programming is <clears throat> funded through the generosity of individual donors, partnerships with businesses and financial contributions from family foundations and granting organizations. We do not receive any yearly funding. And so it's really these on the ground partnerships with community groups and then the generosity of different supporter groups. So if you are interested in learning more about our programs or helping make sure they run smoothly year after year, I encourage you to visit our website at watersheds.ca. Specifically today, we are here for the Freshwater Stewardship Community, which is another of our newer programs. It was launched in 2021 in response to the pandemic. And through the Freshwater Stewardship Community, we're hosting yearly programming of webinars, lesson plans, handouts, and networking opportunities to try and connect Canadians around common issues that they're seeing happening to their freshwater areas and equipping them with resources and recent research and journals that they can use to take local action. So if you are new to our organization or to the freshwater stewardship community, everything is archived on our website. And so you can catch up on all of those different webinars and handouts. And you can do that at uh, watersheds.ca slash freshwater hyphen stewardship. And you will be able to catch up on all of the invasive species programming that we've been putting out this past week as well. So we've had speakers this week talk about garlic mustard and water soldier. And then of course, Deanna here is today to talk about grass carp. Also for the past week and a half or so, we've been posting different social media content about different common invasive species. There are some activities, quizzes, and tomorrow we will be posting a curated toolkit about invasive species. So I encourage you to check out our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn pages, which Nicole will be able to put the direct links in the chat of. And that way you can access those resources, you can share them with your community group or your friends and family, or you can save them for the springtime when all these evasives start coming back into your community and you can know how to take action and report them to different websites. And something else that we do as a part of the freshwater stewardship community is create summary handouts. So this is the one for today's presentation. And it's a great one pager for you to be able to refer back to the key points from the presentations. There's also a section at the bottom that goes over some of the external resources and next steps related to the topic. And it's also a great resource for you to share with a community group like a waterfront association or a fishing game club. 
and help other people learn the information that you gain today. So this will be available for download off of our website later today. And it will also come in a follow-up email from today's presentation so that you can access it and the recording to share with others. And now I'd just like to take a moment to introduce our speaker. So Liana is the program development intern with the Invasive Species Center, where she works with the team to produce a suite of outcomes that strive to address key gaps in invasive species prevention, control, and management. Her primary role is supporting work in aquatic invasive species. However, she also provides support in other initiatives, including impact analyses, species and pathway analyses, community science initiatives, risk and impact assessments, and more. Leanna has an undergrad degree in biology from Algoma University. And with that, Leanna, you are good to take over. Awesome. Thanks so much for that introduction. And hello, everyone. As Monica said, I'm Leanna Hronowitz, and I am the program development intern at the Invasive Species Center. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you all today about grass carp. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and we'll get into it. OK, and just for the sake of bandwidth, I'm going to turn my camera off. Um, just so nothing is too slow. Okay, so I'd like to thank Watershed Canada for having me today. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about grass carp, which is one of the four species of Asian carp. I'm based out of Sault Ste. Marie. One of my favorite hobbies is fishing. Learning about the impacts that Asian carp and especially grass carp can have on our waters has led me to be so passionate about the subject. Um, I'm excited to teach everyone about why their negative impacts matter and why you should care, because at the end of the day, we all have something that grass carp would actually negatively impact if they were to establish um, in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. So we're going to be talking about grass carp and specifically their threat to the Great Lakes. Um, we'll be diving into their biology, their impacts, prevention, and importantly, how you can report or how others can report suspected sightings. Oops. So now a little bit about the Invasive Species Centre. We're a non-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. I'm also going to quickly plug some of our items. So we have a quarterly newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, research and event scans, and we also have webinars as well. So you can find all of that and also sign up on our website. Um, we have also just recently launched training courses. So these are um, interesting little courses that you can take where you can learn about different invasive species or um, items such as oak wilt and invasive forest pests, which are the two that are out right now. Um, and there will be more to come. So you should sign up for our newsletter and be notified when the new ones come out. So I think we should start all, I'm, I'm sure some of you already know what invasive species is, or you've tuned into some of the past um, webinars that have gone on. So just so we're all on the same page, um, for a species to be considered invasive, it must be introduced to an ecosystem outside of its native range and also cause harm. The harm the species can cause can either impact the environment, economy, or society in its new range. So in terms of aquatic invasive species, they can impact biodiversity by outcompeting native species for food and habitat. Sorry, my phone is ringing right now. Um, they can impact the economy and society by negatively impacting activities like recreational and commercial fishing, boating, cottage and lakefront use, and more. So, like I said, it kind of all it will impact us in one way or another. So here are several impacts that invasive species can have when introduced to a new ecosystem that's outside of its native range. Aquatic invasive species in particular could reduce habitat space that native species and species at risk need to survive. They could infect, wound, parasitize, or kill at-risk species. So you can see on the bottom there, there's a lamprey that's attached to a fish. Um, that's an example of that. They can even change the diversity of a landscape and alter how the ecosystem functions. So grass carp specifically would do this to, wet, to wetlands, which we will get into. But this is a good baseline to start to talk off with, just a glimpse of some of the negative impa impacts that invasive species can have, including gra grass carp. They all impact, impact us at some point, whether you are like me and you love to fish, 
or you're a birder or you enjoy boating, hiking, it, it all impacts this one way or another. Invasive species are also on the rise. You can see here that since the 70s, invasive species have increased by 70% across 21 countries. So now let's get into Asian carp. So I'm going to start the talk off by going over what the four species of Asian carp are, and then we'll go directly into grass carp. Sorry. Okay. So Asian carp, um, there are four species of them. Big head, silver, grass carp, and black carp, which you can see all four of them pictured here. These four species belong to the Xenocypridae family and are related to several varieties of minnows. They're all native to the rivers, reservoirs, and lakes of China and southern Russia. Um, and as you can see by the photos, they all look very different. And not only do they look different, their diets and habits are also very different, which means they all give very different impacts in their introduced range. Um, so that's why we're going to focus in on the one species today, but they all have different impacts and would all negatively impact the Great Lakes in a different way. So Asian carp were introduced in the southern U.S. in the late 60s for use as biological control in aquaculture facilities based on their specific diets. Floods allowed them to escape and eventually make their way into the Mississippi River Basin, where they're making their way up towards the Great Lakes, because the Mississippi is obviously connected to the Great Lakes, so that's kind of how they're coming into this direction. Here's a good graphic that goes over um, the invasion front. So in this graphic, you can see that Big Head and Silver Carp are the two at the bottom of Lake Michigan there. Um, they're at the leading edge of the invasion that are going into Lake Michigan and this is from the Mississippi River. And grass carp are the leading edge of the invasion towards Lake Erie. Um, black carp, however, are a bit further behind big head and silver carp, so they're not on this map. Big head and silver carp, like I said, are at the leading edge of the invasion towards Lake Michigan, where the Mississippi reaches in. And this is actually where the Chicago area waterway is, and it's the largest known continuous connection between the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Basin. And as such, as you can probably assume, is the greatest risk for transfer of aquatic invasive species such as Asian carp. So electric barriers have been placed in the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal to prevent the passage of fish by emitting some electric currents. So all this really does is shock the fish and have them turn away or float away. In addition to this, millions of pounds of biomass are also removed annually from these waterways to prevent them from entering Lake Michigan. And few fish have actually been found past the barrier, so it's pretty successful. So we're going to put our little barrier right there, and those two um, are out of block from coming in. So that leaves us with the grass carp over here at the bottom of Lake Erie. So recently, juvenile grass carp caught in the Sandusky River in Ohio, which is a tributary of Lake Erie, were found to have been produced by natural production. In addition to this, a genetic analysis conducted by the USGS recently confirmed that larval fish collection from the Maumee River, which is also another US tributary of Lake Erie, um, during the summer of eight, 2018 were in fact grass carp. Um, however, all this is to say that there is no evidence of an established population in Canadian waters. So for a population to be considered established, it has to have a reproducing population. So in the Canadian waters, there are no established populations at the moment. However, with these two tributaries um, on the U.S. side of Lake Erie having reproducing populations, this makes grass carp the most immediate threat to Canadian waters. Um, as you can see here, to, into Lake Erie and Lake Huron, and obviously all connected through. Um, monitoring and removal efforts are ongoing to ensure that the grass carp does not make its way forward. So these fish are of concern because of the damage they can do to not only Canada's ecological and recreational, but also the economic environment um, if they were to establish in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. They can grow to enormous sizes, which means that they would quickly outgrow the mouth, or it's called the gape, um, of native species that might be able to control their population. So a lot of people always ask, oh, can't our northern pike or our muskie take care of it? Um, but they actually can't because these fish get very, very large, and I'll go into the specifics of their size in a little bit. They also have huge appetites that would allow them to outcompete native species who feed on the same things. All of this is to say that they would negatively impact not only biodiversity by outcompeting native fish, 
but also negatively impacting recreational activities as well as economic activities throughout the Great Lakes. So as I just mentioned, um, grass, or sorry, Asian carp in general can grow very, very large. Um, here's a photo of one right here that you can see is almost the same size as the person beside him. As you can see, this fish is way too big to fit in the mouth of any natural predators that would live in the Great Lakes. It's also important to note that none of the four species are currently established in Canadian waters, as I said, and I really want to drive that point home. Um, and this is all because we are trying to work on prevention and stay in the prevention stage of these fish. So with the help of prevention, monitoring and outreach, along with reporting, our goal is to keep the fish out of the Great Lakes. So now that we're all on the same foot about Asian carp, let's go right into grass carp. Um, so they are one of the four species of Asian carp and the most immediate threat to the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, each of the four species are so different, which makes their impacts different as well. So we'll go into specifically about grass carp today. So grass carp were brought over into the U.S. due to their voracious appetites and their specific diet. So they can actually eat 40% of their body weight a day in aquatic vegetation, which is a lot. <laughs> Pond owners thought that this would be perfect to introduce them to control any overgrowth of aquatic vegetation that the pond might have had. So they thought, oh, our pond has tons of whatever aquatic vegetation, let's bring them over, they can eat it, and our pond will be free of any aquatic vegetation that we don't want. However, that is obviously not the case given their diets, and we'll get into why it's such a problem. Grass carp can only digest about half of the plant material that they consume, which means the rest is expelled back into the water. This promotes toxic algal blooms and has severely negative impacts. It's also important to note that in Canada, it is illegal to import, possess, transport, release, or introduce any Asian carp unless they are dead or eviscerated. And you're probably wondering what the regulations are in the United States. Um, here's a bit of a clear image regarding grass, start, grass carp stocking policies in the US. The states that are red do not allow grass carp. So you can see at the top border in Canada, the states that are green allow diploid or fertile grass carp in the middle, and the states that are yellow allow triploid or sterile grass carp. You can see that the states that are in red are bordering the Great Lakes, which is great. However, there are some that still allow reproducing populations. Um, but again, all of this would help um, in, into avoiding introduction into the Great Lakes Basin. Now let's move on to the biology and some of the specific details regarding grass carp itself. As mentioned earlier, grass carp can consume up to 40% of their body weight a day in aquatic vegetation. That's almost half of their body weight a day. Um, just to put it into perspective, that's like a person eating 40 large pizzas, 430 cups of lettuce, or 180 burgers in one day. So that is a big, big appetite. Um, and that's actually what makes them such a big threat. And like I said, they also expand, expel the remaining plant material, material that they don't digest, um, promoting these toxic algal blooms. Um, these eating habits alter ecosystems by reducing food availability, shelter, and spawning areas for our native fish. So pictured above the grass carp here is actually their teeth. So they're shaped like this to help shred the aquatic vegetation and essentially to help them consume more and, and reach this crazy amount of food that they're able to eat. So their diet and the amount that they consume makes them such a big threat because um, they're quickly able to outcompete native species and um, outcompete them for also the aquatic vegetation that they use for habitat and spawning grounds. Now their preferred habitat is large flowing bodies of water and they spawn in rivers with moderate temperatures. Um, and for egg survival, it's ideal around waters that are at 64 degrees Fahrenheit, but they're actually extremely tolerant fish and can tolerate a wide range of temperatures as low as 32 all the way up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very tolerable fish, um, which makes them, which makes the Great Lakes no problem for them to establish in if they were able to. So these conditions are quite similar to what we experience in the Great Lakes, meaning survival and establishment would not be a problem for these fish um, if they were to enter into our waters. As I said, they're extremely tolerable and the conditions of the Great Lakes are actually very similar to that in their native range. Now 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, I said that these fish can get extremely big. So grass carp in particular can mature in a quick two years. They can reach a maximum height that is about five feet long and 80 pounds um, in weight. So again, this just shows how quickly a fish that is this size can grow and outgrow the mouth of any natural predators that might be able to feed on it. Um, and black carp, actually one of the four species of Asian carp can get almost six feet long and about 180 pounds in weight. So these are definitely huge fish if they grow to their maximum size and would be no match for any of our uh, native fish. Now for the impacts. Now this is a very important section to talk about kind of why this fish would alter maybe some of the things that you like to do, why you should care, and why we should continue to talk about grass carp and their effects. And these range from environmental to economic to social impacts. So to start with the ecological impacts, grass carp primarily consume aquatic vegetation, and like I said, can consume up to 40% of their body weight a day, but only digest half of this plant material. The rest of this undigested food is expelled back into the water and can create murky water conditions. Um, you can see this in the GIF on the right hand side, the ecosystem before grass carp establishment has clean water, a diverse amount of wildlife, including birds and fish, trees, aquatic plants, and just overall looks like a healthy ecosystem. And then you could see the next slide, um, the ecosystem, oops, the ecosystem um, after grass carp establishment has murky water, less uh, species, less aquatic vegetation. And you can kind of tell that all the fish in this area are grass carp. There's no biodiversity. So you can see what a grass carp would be able to do to an ecosystem if it were to establish. So that is not something that we would love to see to our Great Lakes. Grass carp are also a huge threat to wetlands. Wetlands are an important part of the Great Lakes ecosystem and provide nursery areas for fish and also support a variety of wildlife they also control flooding, filter nutrients, and harmful pollutants, and they also provide food and habitat for native fish, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. Vegetated areas near the shore areas um, would also be the most vulnerable habitats. Loss of nearshore vegetation could negatively impact water quality because plants along the shoreline slow surface runoff and filter contaminants before they reach the lake. So a grass carp would be a huge threat to wetlands for that reason. Um, and again, not something we'd like to see in the Great Lakes happen. Also, it's estimated that just 10 grass carp per hectare can reduce wetland vegetation by up to 50%. So just 10 grass carp can have a huge impact on our wetlands. Now, as I mentioned before, I love to fish. So this is a part that hit home for me. And if you love to fish as well, and just for the overall health of the ecosystem, it's important to have biodiversity in any species, including your fish. So grass carp would also cause negative impacts to a predicted 33 fish species. This includes some great angling species that I mentioned that I love that are found in the Great Lakes, such as smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, muskie, northern pike, walleye, yellow perch, and a lot more. Grass carp having such voracious diets would ruin suitable habitat and spawning grounds for most of these fish. They also have the ability to decrease aquatic vegetation that other fish feed on or use to ambush prey. So your northern pike and your muskie, uh, they use the aquatic vegetation to ambush prey and they wouldn't be able to do that if grass carp were established and eating all of the aquatic vegetation. So many of these fish also spawn in these areas and that would cause tons of issues if the grass carp were to eat all the vegetation that these fish are used, are used to spawning in. And for the social impacts, grass carp would also have a variety of negative impacts to these social activities. Um, that you can see on your screen. They would impact recreational fishing, boating, commercial fishing, substance fishing, wildlife viewing, beaches and lakefront use, and even hunting. So I'm going to get into detail on the next slide about these, but these are all obviously social activities that most people love to do. Um, and these are actually all related to economic impacts as well. So all of these social impacts in turn turn the Great Lakes into a um, economic a large economic value with tourism, which I'll get into. So the Great Lakes Basin has proven to be an extremely valuable resource to the Canadian economy through several ventures and industries that are all related to those social, or so, sorry, those social impacts that we were talking about. 
So the Great Lakes actually contributes 13.8 billion US dollars to the Canadian economy every year through commercial, recreational and subsistence fishing, water use, water-based hunting, oil and gas, commercial navigation, recreational boating, beach and lakefront and wildlife viewing. So for recreational fishing, that industry is valued at 556 million US dollars. Grass carp would impact a recreational would impact recreational fishing by causing a reduction to the popular angling species that we just mentioned. Anglers also contribute a large amount of money to the economy through fishing licenses, equipment, gear, and through tourism, through traveling to go fishing. So reduced recreational fishing industries would have an impact on other businesses and livelihoods that depend on this sector, such as bait and tackle shops. In terms of subsistence fishing, Indigenous communities have inhabited the shores of the Great Lakes for generations and have cultivated a unique relationship with the rivers and lakes of the basin. Many of these communities engage in fishing activities, often relying on subsistence fishing for food and cultural purposes. Grass carp could destruct this and interfere with knowledge transfer and learning to new generations if there were less species to fish for um, and less, um, less fish in that sense. The Canadian recreational boating industry is valued at 2.3 billion US dollars. While silver carp are particular a worry for this industry because they can jump up to three meters in the air, um, which would obviously damage vessels or passengers, grass carp would cause damage to this industry by decreasing the aesthetic value of boating areas. Um, like I mentioned, they expel half of the food that they don't eat, causing toxic algal, algal blooms. And you wouldn't necessarily wanna be boating in waters with intense algal blooms that also usually relate to a pretty noxious smell. The commercial fishing industry is valued at 230 million US dollars. Grass carp would impact this industry by causing a reduction in commercial catches. Um, commercial catch size would then reduce, would be reduced in value, or sorry, would be reduced due to decreases in native fish population sizes and overall quality as a result of direct competition with grass carp for food and destruction of habitat. There would also be an increase in operational costs of commercial fishing due to the need to travel farther to catch fish, which ultimately results in a decreased amount of profits um, for that sector. Wildlife viewing is also quite popular along the shores of the Great Lakes. We've got tons of great birds and just the ecosystems around the Great Lakes are exceptionally beautiful. As mentioned earlier, grass carp expel half the food that they would digest back into the water, as I mentioned, um, which would ultimately reduce the water quality and increase potentially dangerous toxins entering the water and promote those algal blooms um, that pose increased health risk to the Great Lake users while participating in wildlife viewing activities. And also other species wouldn't be able to inhabit those areas and therefore you wouldn't be able to see some of those species that you love to see out on the Great Lakes. Now the value of Canadian beaches and lakefronts is 235 million US dollars. The toxic chemicals and algal blooms that we just talked about would definitely cause negative impacts to beach and lakefront use. Um, and like I said, they can also cause noxious smells that people would definitely not want to enjoy on the waterfront. Shoreline values would also decrease for these same reasons. So people that have property out on the shorelines um, where grass carp would, have, would be established, um, if they're experiencing algal blooms and noxious smells, the property values are gonna decrease a lot. And lastly, hunting would actually be impacted as well. So grass carp would negatively impact waterfowl hunting opportunities. They destroy wetlands that many of these popular species depend on for food and habitat, which could result in decreased hunting opportunities and then a decrease in economic expenditures from these hunting opportunities, such as fish, or sorry, such as hunting licenses um, and such. And then also some of the livelihoods and shops that rely on this, similar to the bait and tackle shops. So lots of economic impacts here and also um, impacts that are ultimately negatively impacting our social. Um, social experiences as well. So now that we've learned all about the impacts and some of the biology about grass carp and what they can do, now let's get into what is being done, some of the prevention and how we can report. Now it's important to talk about the invasion curve here um, and how this kind of relates to prevention and how important prevention of a species is before its arrival. So the gray fish you can see here, uh, let's pretend that is the US. So here you can see this graph is showing prevention on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. At the prevention stage where the fish is right now, it is much more cost-effective to work on prevention measures. So you could see 
that prevention cost or management costs is low and it's in the prevention of introduction um, on the curve. So costs are low. As they spread further and become more abundant, the cost increases. So this is what the US experienced, which the spread of, uh, from the spread of Asian carp. Now that the fish are abundant, they are in the management stage where costs are much higher to work with the biomass of these species. So you can see that as time goes and as management, um, as the species enters the management stage, it is exponentially increasing the amount of costs it's going to cost. So it's better to stay in that prevention stage where, enter Canada in red, that is where we are. We're still in the prevention stages um, of Asian carp as none are established here in Canadian waters. So keeping these fish in the prevention stages and working on the prevention measures rather than management is a much more cost-effective option as you can see here. So it's best to stay in that range and keep our costs low so we never have to get into that management stage. Now we'll talk a little bit about what is being done at the moment. So in Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Asian Carp Program visits 37 high-risk locations in Lakes Erie, Huron, Ontario, and Superior to conduct early surveillance sampling. These locations were selected based on predictive models, which indicated that they have suitable habitats for Asian carp species. Locations are sampled at least once per year, and those that are predicted um, by ecological models to be at high risk of invasion are resampled up to a maximum of three times between May and November. The number of sample sites at each location varies depending on the size and location and habitat types available. So Fisheries and Oceans is out on the water doing some early prevention measures. MNRF conducts eDNA sampling to test for traces of Asian carp DNA as well. So eDNA, if you're asking, is environmental DNA, and it's a tool that has been used um, for early detection and surveillance in the US since 2009, and recently in Canada since 2012. So what eDNA is, is it's a sampling, um, sorry, it's a process in which genetic material such as cells containing DNA from tissue, mucus, feces, or urine is extracted from water samples to help determine the potential presence of an invasive species, and in this case, Asian carp. At the moment, eDNA cannot identify whether a fish is live or dead, or if it's from other sources such as bilge water, boats, storm sewers, or anything like that, but at least it gives us a baseline of what to expect. Um, and it's also an increasing tool that we'll see more um, being used in the future. Many American agencies are also working on monitoring and prevention on the US side of the Great Lakes. So it's definitely a collaborative effort and a bi-national effort to keep this fish from establishing in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. So as for us at the Invasive Species Center, we primarily, primarily work on outreach to target audiences to teach them about how to identify and report Asian carp. A few ways that we do this is through events, trade shows, webinars like this one, um, social media, and more recently, we've actually worked with influencers, so different fishing influencers because our target audience is anglers. We've worked with industry professionals such as Jay Siemens, Ashley Ray, the Fish in Canada show, and many more to help increase the amount of traction that we get. So what, we, what they do is they use their organic material and platforms while incorporating some of our material to spread the word about how Asian carp will affect anglers uh, because, as I said, anglers are our primary target audience. So one of the things that we promote the most in our outreach is the Grass Carp Reporting and ID Guide. On our website, there's a place to download this guide or print it so you can have it easily um, available and ready to use. So essentially what the guide does is it walks you through how to use the ID um, if you catch a fish that you're unsure about that you think might be a grass carp. This is because in the Great Lakes Basin, grass carp have um, many species that they are commonly confused with due to their similarities. I often hear that people are like, oh, I've caught one or I've seen one, and it happens to be one of their lookalike species that I will get into. Once the user is sure that they have captured a grass carp, um, they are to take a photo and report it either through the invading species hotline or ed maps. And once the fish is reported, it is to be killed without damaging the head or eyes and kept in a cooler with its head above ice. And the most important thing to hear uh, here to note is to not release it back into the water. Um, as DFO will collect it. So the reason we primarily target uh, anglers um, to download this guide is because they are often the first set of eyes out on the water. If they were to capture a grass carp in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes, we would want to be sure that they know how to identify the fish 
and that they don't really sit back into the water. So the more trained eyes out on the water, the better. Now here are the four main identification features of grass carp. Its eyes are level with its mouth. It has a short dorsal fin instead of running all the way down its back. Um, it doesn't have barbells or whiskers that some of the commonly confused species do have. And it has a large dark cross hatched scale pattern. So this is our grass carp. Now I'm gonna walk you through some of the common lookalikes and it may be easy to see on the screen that they don't look alike, but when these fish are out on the water, they can look very, very similar. So here's a grass carp and a common carp. This is usually what people do end up seeing that are saying that they've caught, thinking it's a, a grass carp, um, but they are different as you can tell here. So the common carp has eyes at the top of its head where grass carp has eyes levels with the mouth. You can see that that dorsal fin is different. So the common carp has a long dorsal fin. The grass carp has a short dorsal fin and common carp has those barbells or whiskers and the grass carp does not. So these two species are different. Here's the grass carp and a fall fish. So again, the dorsal fin's a little different. The fall fish has a more of a blunt dorsal fin or the grass carp has more of a rounded short dorsal fin. The eye shape is different. And sometimes the fall fish has small or concealed barbels where the grass carp never will have barbels. So again, you can tell they look quite similar, but they are different. So as for legislation, there are over 30 federal and Ontario provincial acts that mention invasive species that are either intentionally or uh, incidentally introduced. Only a few of these are rev relevant to aquatic invasive species and even fewer specifically mentioned Asian carp. And um, we have a great section about this on our website that goes over this legislation and some of the specific details if you're curious about that. Overall, it's important to note that in Canada, it is illegal to possess, sell, trade, transport, or release any species of Asian carp unless it is dead and eviscerated. Another piece of legislation regarding aquatic invasive species is about bait dumping. So you are not to dump your bait um, within 30 meters of any water body. It is illegal in Ontario. So this is because you truly may never know what exactly is in your bait bucket. This includes not only the bait, but the water too. You can see here how similar juvenile grass carp look to common bait fish species. On the top is an invasive juvenile grass carp and on the left, um, on the left and a native striped shiner on the right where on the bottom, there's another invasive grass carp, a juvenile again, and a common native shiner. So um, they are very similar looking and you just might never know what's in your bait bucket. Um, and as I mentioned, in Ontario, it is illegal to dump your bait, both live or dead within 30 meters of any water body. Um, and this also goes for worms and dirt as well and the water that the fish is in and everything there. So that's another way that you can help to not potentially spread invasive species. To finish, I'll leave this reporting slide here so you can see the three main ways to report an invasive species in Ontario. Your quickest route is to call the invading species hotline, but you can also report on EdMaps online or even download the EdMaps app, which is available for iPhone and Android and it's easy to use. Um, it's also important to note here to always take a photo and note your location. So luckily, most smartphones now um, have your location while you take a photo, but it's good to note it anyways. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. For listening, for listening to my presentation about grass carp. I hope that you learned something new today and maybe found a reason as to why grass carp may impact your life. Maybe it's something you didn't know that you're like, oh, that, that would affect me in, in one way or another. And maybe it's just that grass carp aren't established here yet and we wanna keep them in the prevention stage. So I hope you learned something. Um, I'm happy to take some questions and I will leave my email up on the next slide if you would prefer to contact me through email. Awesome, thank you so much, Leanna. A lot of great information in there and some people have submitted questions. So we'll just go through those one at a time. I think we should have enough time for all of them. And so we'll start with a question that was actually presented in yesterday's webinar. It was with uh, staff from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and they were talking about some funding that was available through the Invasive Species Center. So I was wondering if you could expand on any funding opportunities that you know of, either from your organization or from other organizations. Yeah, so I believe 
um, they're probably talking about our micro grants. So we are happy to announce that we are offering micro grants again for the 2023-2024 um, fiscal year. So what you can do, I don't know if the application form is out yet, but um, if you go on our website or if you sign up for our newsletter, it's on there as well. But on our website, you can find the micro grant section and there will be a spot to apply once the applications go live, which is going to be very soon. Um, you can apply for a micro grant and I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's $1,000 um, towards invasive species management. So again, um, all that information is on our website and yep, that's probably what they were talking about. Okay, perfect. The next question is a representative from a waterfront association and they're wondering what is the step that they could be taking for Asian carp because they're not currently there. So what could they do to engage their community and start those conversations when the invasive isn't actually in their community yet? That's a great question. And as I mentioned, prevention is so important. It's much more important than when the species is actually already there because your best bet is to keep them out as best as possible. So your best option as a waterfront um, association is to talk to people who love to go fishing or love to boat on uh, your lake, um, how to identify and report these fish. So the main thing is that we won't know that there's anything in there until either something has come up through the prevention measures and the monitoring, or sometimes anglers catch one and they don't know what it is and they just put it back in the water. So your best bet is to teach um, everybody how to identify what this fish is, how it is different from some of our native species, and how to properly report it. Great. And then the next question is from someone in Manitoba. So they were wondering if you could expand on how these fish would impact prairie provinces since Lake Winnipeg is the largest fishery outside of the Great Lakes. That's a good question. Um, and again, there's no established populations in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. And um, again, this is Great Lakes pretty specific, but the impacts would be the same for any body of water. So if there's um, large areas that are wetland or lots of aquatic vegetation, this species, the grass carp, would essentially wipe out most of the aquatic vegetation that would be in that lake. Um, and again, native species, they use that aquatic vegetation, they either eat it or they spawn in it, they use it to ambush predators. So this would directly outcompete um, and affect the great fishery that Lake Winnipeg is. Um, and yeah, the best bet is to prevent them from, from coming that way. Okay, the next question, I don't know if this is under your umbrella of your job description, but someone's asking about the legislation and policy section that's on the Invasive Species Center website and any advice that you give them for individuals who are trying to engage their municipality around invasive species awareness and prevention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, I would say if you are part of an organization, um, applying for those micro grants, if that's something that you are able to do within an organization or um, some an organization in your municipality can, telling them about the micro grants. Um, and in terms of the legislation and talking to municipalities, um, it would just be about getting a group together. And I believe going forth with the, um, just showing that what, legislation is there and kind of what impacts different species in your area might have. Um, yeah, that's about as best as I could answer that question. Um, but we do have a program and policy team. So if there's something specific that you needed answered, um, you can send me an email and I'm happy to forward that to someone from our policy team. Perfect. The next question is, how, if at all, do you see climate change impacting the spread of grass carp and other aquatic invasive species? That's a great question. And that's something that our forum was actually all about, was about uh, invasive species in a changing climate. Um, we have a whole section on our website regarding climate change and invasive species. But in terms of aquatic invasive species in general, um, as water warms, species that can tolerate those higher, or species that tolerate higher temperatures, 
their range is now going to be able to tolerate a warmer water, warmer body of water. So species that could only tolerate, let's say, water that's warmer than what we have up north, if any of our waters are starting to warm and eventually get warm enough for that species to be able to survive, if they get introduced, they'll have no problem surviving. So it's gonna just allow for more species to be able to survive in more environments, which um, isn't good, obviously. And in terms of grass carp, they are very um, tolerant to the Great Lakes. If they were to establish here, the water would be no problem. But at the end of the day, warming water and warming climate would just allow for um, them to have a higher survival rate. Okay, the next question is about grass carp specifically. Do you know if they eat Phragmites? Not too sure. That's a good question though. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Again, the whole reason they were brought here was for use as biological control. Um, so not only would they eat Phragmites, but they would also eat absolutely anything else that would be there. So definitely not good to use as biological control um, and because they're so easily spread. So that's not something we would want to consider. And they're also not established in Canada. So definitely not something that we would want to consider without them being established. Okay, the next question is about the Invasive Species Center. If you are aware of any long-term studies that your projects or your staff are contributing about invasive species and the impacts they're having on native species? Um, that's a great question as well. And I know there are some going on. I don't know the specific details, um, but again, if that's something you're interested in, please shoot me an email and I'd be happy to put you in touch with some people working on some of those long-term studies. Okay, great. Those are all of the questions that we have. Nicole has just put in a link in the chat if people are able to take about a minute or two to fill in our short evaluation survey for today's webinar. It's very helpful information for us to know what you thought of today's presentation and also if there are other topics that you would like us to explore in a future webinar. So you can do that at the link that Nicole just put in the chat. We'll also be sending it around to everyone in the follow-up email with today's recording and the handout that we mentioned, which summarizes a lot of the external resources Leanna talked about in her presentation as well. So a nice one-stop piece of information for you to share with anyone who you think might be interested. I don't see any other questions, so I think we will end a bit early today. Thank you so much, Leanna, for giving us your time and your expertise about this and helping give more information about how people can make sure these species don't get into Canada and how we can protect our freshwater health. Thank you.